May I ask those who are leaving the chamber to do so quietly, please? And the final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7724 in the name of Lewis MacDonald on workforce concerns regarding helicopter safety in the North Sea. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Lewis MacDonald to open the debate for around seven minutes. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm delighted to welcome members of Unite the Union to the public gallery this evening, as well as representatives of Airbus and others who have stayed for this debate. And I thank colleagues across parties for their support. Tonight gives us an opportunity to put on the record the views of offshore workers themselves on an issue of the utmost importance to them and their families. Offshore oil and gas workers earn their living in a hazardous industry, in a hazardous environment. Drilling rigs and production platforms are tough places to work the world over, nowhere more so than in the waters off our coasts. But offshore safety is not just about the place of work on a chemical processing plant many miles from dry land and a long way from the nearest hospital. It is also about the journey to work, which carries risks of its own. Most people travel to work by train or by bus, by bike or by car, on a daily basis. Oil workers make a journey too. They travel every month to the heliport in Aberdeen. Then they make another journey on a helicopter to the place where they will work long shifts on successive days for often three weeks at a time. Sometimes they will travel first to from Aberdeen to Shetland, then fly again from there to an offshore installation, and then do the same journey in reverse when coming home. That's a lot of hours in midair. I've travelled offshore myself a number of times in the last 30 years, and I can tell members it is not the same as taking the bus. A passenger on a bus does not need to be trained in advance on how to get out if things go wrong. He or she does not need a survival suit or all the gear required to stay afloat and keep breathing in the event of an accident. Never mind going through that whole process of kitting up twice in the same journey when the trip involves changing from one vehicle to another halfway there. So it's important to understand what the journey is like and what that implies for workforce safety. Formal certification of safety on its own is not enough. Taking a chopper to work in the North Sea is not the same as joyriding at an air show on a summer's afternoon. The journey is also about the gear, the safety procedures, the unpredictable flying conditions, the hazardous environment. So when workers do all of that before they get to work, they need the certification, of course, but they also need to feel the aircraft they are travelling on is fit for purpose. That is what is at issue here this evening. Super Puma helicopters do not feel safe to many of those who may be asked to step on board. Unite the Union has collected thousands of signatures which say that that is the view of their offshore members, and some of those workers are here with us here this evening. Airbus, who make Super Pumas, have done their own survey. They found that 62% of helicopter crew and passengers in the North Sea would not fly in Super Pumas, given the choice. They also found that 44% were unaware of the efforts Airbus had made to address the issues which caused Super Pumas to be grounded in the first place. And of course, those efforts are significant. Airbus have a good deal of professional engineering expertise and they have applied all their technology and expertise to addressing the critical issues and they have briefed MSPs accordingly. The facts of the matter are not in dispute. They have been established by national and international civil aviation regulators. The Super Puma 225 which crashed in Norway last year did so because a crack developed in the gearbox which led to catastrophic failure and the helicopter dropped out of the sky. 13 passengers and crew died as a result. Airbus have made public what they believe caused the crack to develop where they did, and they have put mitigation measures into place. For example, two pre different companies previously supplied versions of the part that Airbus believe was at the heart of the failure in the gearbox, and Airbus in future will use only one version from one supplier. Mechanisms for detection of faults or failures have been improved and maintenance rules and procedures have been tightened up. 
All of those steps are welcome, but they do not guarantee that such faults or failures can never happen again, which is why so many people remain unconvinced. It is important, of course, to know how and why a crack develops, but it is also important to know how long it takes before it becomes critical, how long there is to take action to deal with it. It is right to remove the less safe of two alternative components from the supply chain, but we also need to know if there are other parts of the aircraft where safety critical components are supplied by different companies and what is being done about those. It is interesting to know that the Airbus could reduce the number of seats and improve the internal cabin space in the 225, but there is no certainty that will happen if helicopter operating companies cannot make a profit flying with fewer passengers. There are wider questions too, and not just for Airbus. My friend and former colleague Aberdeen MP Frank Doran won the support of the Transport Select Committee at Westminster for a public inquiry into helicopter safety in the North Sea back in 2014, but that call was rejected by the Tory Transport Secretary of the day. RMT, of course. Mark MacDonald. I'm grateful to lose my offer giving a heel. I appreciate given my ministerial office I cannot contribute a speech to the debate, but given this affects a number of my constituents as well, I wonder if you'd agree that as well as the communication with the workforce, which is essential, there is also the wider communication that is required with family of workforce, but also communities, particularly Dyson Bridge of Dawn in my constituency, which regularly experience helicopter flights over built up areas and often uh, feel concerns around what the impact of helicopter safety might be on those communities. Mark McDonald, Lewis a, McDonald. A, a very good point and a very strong point because it, a lot of this is about communication and, and, and in a sense that is the central point. It is not only about technical solutions to technical problems, it is also about the communication with the workforce, with their families uh, and with indeed the wider community. And so hence the call that was made three years ago for a public inquiry into stand, uh, helicopter safety, not just around standards but also around the communications that relate to that. And RMT and other of the unions within the offshore coordinating group has repeated the call this week for a public inquiry. So I'd be very interested to hear from the Minister in responding to the debate uh, what the Scottish Government's view is of that matter, recognising, of course, that the responsibility lies elsewhere. Offshore trade unions have also argued that helicopter transport needs to be on the agenda of the oil industry's regulators, the Oil and Gas Authority and the Health and Safety Executive, as well as uh, the agenda of the Civil Aviation Authority. Because again, that makes the same point. This is not just about technical standards, it is about workforce engagement and confidence, and it is an issue for the whole industry. That is why the partnership of workforce, unions and regulators must be strengthened, not weakened, if the North Sea is to have a safe and successful future, and why the views of the workforce must be heeded by all concerned. Only by putting the workforce at the centre can we have the oil and gas industry we need operating to the standards which those who work in it deserve. Thank you. Uh, can we have speeches of around four minutes, please? And I call Marie Goujon to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I really want to thank Lewis MacDonald for bringing forward this uh, members' debate today. And I completely concur with his last sentiment there, that the workforce really have to be at the centre of this. Now, sadly, one of my earliest duties in this chamber after being elected, and actually I think it was the very first question that I put to this chamber, was a question to the First Minister about the safety of the Super Puma H225 fleet in Scotland. And this came after the tragedy in April 2016, which took the lives of 13 people, including that of one of my constituents, Mr Ian Stewart, who was a father of two from Lawrence Kirk. Now, at that point, the fleet was grounded, and rightly so, so that an investigation could be carried out uh, to ascertain why this model of helicopter at that point responsible for around 140,000 flights each year across the UK, appeared to have recurring problems with its gearbox. Now, in the period from 2009 to 2016, four flights had come down in the North Sea with sighted mechanical failure, two of them leading to fatalities with a loss of 29 lives. Because of that, it really isn't difficult to understand the concerns and the reluctance of offshore workers and their families at home to travel offshore when they depend on the helicopter fleet for transport to and from platforms in what really is a challenging and often hostile environment that Lewis MacDonald uh, described earlier. Now, Lewis MacDonald also pointed out in his motion the 
that Airbus, the company which makes the Super Puma helicopters, has carried out a survey of pilots and passengers, uh, which found that 62% of those surveyed would prefer not to fly in Super Pumas, and that 44% were unaware of the work carried out to improve safety since that tragedy in 2016. Now, I raised this when I met with Airbus, who manufactures Super Pumas last week, and I wanted to discuss the Civil Aviation Authority's recent decision and really to ask them what had been done to improve the safety of the workforce in the oil industry. Airbus went through in detail each of the incidents that had happened over the past few years, and in particular that incident of April 2016, and the methods that had been carried out by the hundreds of engineers and scientists who investigated not only the design of the part that caused the problem, but also the history of the individual gearbox, which had failed so catastrophically from its construction, its individual parts, its transportation, installation and final operation. The outcome of their investigation found what they believed to be a combination of factors that led to the failure of that gearbox in 2016 and factors that have since resulted in a number of changes being made, some of which Lewis MacDonald outlined. Those gearbox parts which identified as contributing to that accident were replaced with alternatives already safely in use in other models of helicopter. Airbus reduced the service life for various gearbox parts from 4,000 flight hours to 1,000 flight hours. Uh, the particle detection system and related inspection criteria had also been improved and a new transport, transit packaging system had been introduced which monitors the gearboxes for any unexpected forces. Forces which they believed contributed to the failure of parts such as in the incident last year. And in addition to that, aircraft operators are no longer permitted to separate the modules of the main gearbox and must send them to Airbus's own maintenance venues. And I hasten to add that that's only a very brief, non-technical overview of some of the changes that were made. When I asked them about the results of the survey, they told me that the company still had to engage with the industry as a whole, uh, including the workforce, trade unions and, and operators. And to me, that is one of the real key issues here, because I think it's all very well that as MSPs and politicians, we can be briefed, but we're not the ones that have to be convinced about the safety of the fleet. I, I very much appreciated the chance to meet with Airbus last week, but I'm conscious that the information and the briefing that I received and the opportunity to ask questions about that is something which those working in the industry are yet to have, as well as the point that was very well made by uh, Mark MacDonald, that wider communities also need to be informed about uh, the, the changes that have, the suggested changes that have taken place. Airbus are just at the start of that process and they still, still do have a lot of work to do. And there's also the fact that while we have a preliminary report from the Accident Investigation Board in Norway into the incident, the final investigation report is still to come. I just want to finally stress that I'm fully behind and fully support our offshore workers. And it's our absolute duty to ensure as far as possible that our workforce only fly in aircraft where they not only feel safe, but they are safe. My husband has to go offshore. I have family and friends working in the industry who have to do the same. You can't live in the northeast of Scotland and not know anybody that works offshore. And I would never expect anyone to do anything that I myself would not be willing or happy to do if I was in their position. And that's why I would only support the return of this helicopter to service if the workforce feel happy and secure enough to travel in it. They're the ones taking the risk, and it's only right that we support them. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Burnett to be followed by Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking Lewis MacDonald for bringing this important topic uh, to members' debate today. It is, without a doubt, a consensus that the loss of life due to the failure of Super Puma helicopters was unacceptable and a tragedy we do not want to see again. Aberdeen and the wider oil and gas industry across the UK can take pride on its health and safety record and continues to be a world leader in this regard. And there is no doubt that Super Puma helicopters have brought concerns for both oil companies and workers alike. And as Oil and Gas UK stated earlier this year, the safety of the offshore workforce is of paramount importance to the industry. And more recently, that the decision to use the Super Puma rests with the operator, its workforce, and their helicopter operator. However, I'm grateful that the manufacturers of the Super Puma helicopters Airbus have taken these concerns seriously. Airbus are now in the process of meeting with workers from oil companies who use these helicopters to inform them of the changes they have made to make the aircraft safe. 
and it will be interesting to see what feedback is received and how Airbus acts on any further concerns. And after investing millions in, invest in improving the safety of their aircraft, Airbus have carried out thousands of tests on all parts of their helicopters. Following this investigation, they have now improved practices by increasing their frequency of inspections, imposing stricter criteria, overhauling detection methods for failures, increasing monitoring of individual parts, reducing maximum operation times for parts by a factor of four, and gone as far as prohibiting parts within their aircraft completely. This is the kind of rigorous health and safety checks that we now expect from our oil and gas industry. And that Airbus have done their utmost to live up to this rigor is no less than we would expect. However, the problem that Airbus faced is to regain the confidence of workers. And this was evident by the recent survey results. However, with checks having only been completed earlier this year, it is too early to call for an all-out ban. It is also too early to expect workers to be aware of the work that has gone into improving the safety of the aircraft. Now, I completely understand workers' reasons for being cautious, but Airbus have produced a thorough investigation and performed thousands of tests. And Airbus should now be allowed time to get around all companies who use the helicopters so that they have adequate time to speak with workers and reassure them of their safety. The health and safety checks have been completed, revisions have been considered, changes have been made, and Airbus now needs to communicate this to those who use the Super Puma and restore confidence. Thank you. Richard Leonard to be followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by drawing attention to my register of interest, in particular my membership of the Unite and GMB trade unions? And can I also welcome uh, those trade union members who are here in the public gallery tonight, who are the lifeblood of the trade union movement. And uh, let me begin by reminding Parliament that it was the Abaddonian trade union leader, Jimmy Milne, who, when he became the General Secretary of the Scottish TUC, uh, led on the call of his predecessor, Jimmy Jack, uh, who in 1972 had demanded the establishment of a Scottish Parliament as a workers' parliament. Well, I'm not quite sure that Jimmy Milne and Jimmy Jack would say that this is what we have achieved yet, uh, but can I welcome Lewis MacDonald's initiative in securing this timely debate in Parliament on a matter of the highest importance to workers in this most strategically important industry in Scotland. It is a primary industry where the extraction of a natural and national asset comes up all too often against conflicting interests between multinational private industrial ownership, whose first duty it is to shareholder returns, and a workforce for whom our first duty, our first duty in this parliament must be to secure their health and safety at work, including their safety in traveling backwards and forwards to work. You know, if we had anything resembling industrial democracy, we would not need to have this debate at all. But it is precisely that we do not have industrial democracy, that we have an industrial balance of power tilted in favour of the owners and the operators, that this is such a highly charged debate. So it is a bit disappointing, but not surprising to hear the Conservative Party, as I understand it, refusing point blank to back the trade union campaign. And we heard it again just a few moments ago. The decision to use the Super Puma rests, they say, with the operator, their workforce, and their helicopter operator. This is, in my view, a negation of the Cullen Edict, that in the North Sea, the frequency of accidents may be low, but the potential consequences are very serious. And as others have pointed out, even Airbus's own figures reveal that as many as 62% of all those who have been surveyed by them are, and I quote, very uncomfortable and unlikely to fly in a super puma again. And we must all understand that when we add to this the 15% who, I quote, are uncomfortable and would need more safety information before flying again, it becomes abundantly clear why the Unite campaign 
has moved from a back home safe campaign to a no comeback for the Puma, make the North Sea Puma free campaign. And I hope that the Minister, in his closing remarks, will pledge his full support to this important trade union safety campaign. Deputy Presiding Officer, there is an added poignancy to this debate tonight because the Super Puma crash just off the coast at Bergen in Norway, which concerns us tonight, in which 13 souls lost their lives, took place on Friday the 29th of April 2016, the day after International Workers' Memorial Day. The day when we, lest us not forget, remember the dead, but fight for the living. So if this is to be more than a slogan, we need to act upon it. And as the RMT union reminds us in their briefing for this debate, next year is the 30th anniversary of the Piper Alpha disaster. The pain still being felt by widows, orphans and survivors right across the country. So we owe it to them to find a new determination in this parliament to say to those offshore workers who are with us tonight and to all those beyond, we in this parliament are on your side and it is the duty of parliament to make sure that these tragedies never happen again, that we not only hear you, but that we listen to you as well. Uh, can I just say to um, visitors in the gallery, please, it's not appropriate to either clap or catcall. <laughs> um, perhaps at the end, if you want to show your appreciation at the end of the debate, there'll be an opportunity. Okay. Now, Gillian Martin, please to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> and thank you to Lewis MacDonald for securing this important debate. I was going to say for our area, but we often forget as North Easters how many other people in Scotland, and particularly the north of England, do work offshore. And I'm coming from this debate from the perspective of those who work offshore and their families. More than 20,000 flights are made every year to installations hundreds of miles uh, off land where men and women go to work for weeks before returning home to their family and friends. And we know the journey to and from the installation is the, potentially the most hazardous aspect of working offshore as it stands by its very nature. And we must therefore make sure that the helicopters in use are the safest available. For nearly 20 years when I ran my own company, I've periodically flown to platforms in the North Sea, west of Shetland and beyond, and there are considerable procedures, precautions, mitigation measures and training in place. But if something goes wrong with a helicopter over the North Sea, every one of us on that flight knows that the chances of survival of a ditching helicopter are not high. And I can understand why those who have to make those journeys with far more frequency than I ever did May, may now need more reassurances about the helicopters they're asked to board. The Union Unite, uh, mentioned a lot today, representing their members, have just in the last couple of days reinforced its message that strike action will be threatened if the super Pumas are put back into use. And we know that certain companies have at this point decided they will not put their personnel on them, despite Airbus reassurances on their safety, and the fact that the UK and Norwegian civil aviation authorities have, as of July this year, deemed the Super Puna safe. But in a workforce survey, as many people have mentioned, the 62% of respondents said they would not want to use a Super Puma again, and a further 15% said they would not be comfortable boarding until more guarantees about safety changes had been explained. In other words, that's three out of four of North Sea workers are unhappy about boarding a Super Puma again at this point. And we know that while the fleet of super pumas are not being used in the UK, they continue to be used all over the world. Um, Airbus has also said that a, a full understanding of the cause of the crash in Norway has put forward a number of measures which makes um, them confident that a similar tragedy would not be repeated. And, and others have mentioned what those measures are, and we've obviously had briefings as MSPs, and I won't repeat what my colleagues have said about, about them. But... The death of 13 people last year off the coast of Norway was a real turning point, I think, for many offshore workers who do not feel that they can make their journeys to work on these helicopters any longer. And of course, they already had significant lingering confidence issues with the integrity of the Super Puma after the tragic accident off the coast of Peterhead in 2009, where 16 people died. 
including Stuart Wood from my own home village of Newmarker. And I can't stand here today as the MSP of his mother, Audrey, and his sister, Kerry, and advocate anything other than extreme caution over this helicopter that has repeatedly had issues before and since that devastating day. And I guess extreme caution really translates at this point into not using them again, given the recurring faults. So can Airbus and helicopter operators do more to communicate and convince North Sea workers and operators they can feel confident travelling in the Super Puma? Well, yes, perhaps, and it has been pointed out they really are at the start of this communication process and we've all made suggestions on how that can be improved today. So, but, but right now, I'm not so sure that really confidence can ever come back. And until it does, I don't think any of us should ask people who face significant risk already to do the jobs that they do offshore to board them. Uh, before I call Mr Bibby, uh, there are a, a few other people who wish to speak in the debate. So I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8143 to extend the debate by up to 30, uh, sorry, by up to 30 minutes. And can I invite Lewis MacDonald to move a motion without notice? Thank you very much. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That's therefore agreed, and I call Neil Bibby to be followed by Graham Day. Thank you, President Officer. I just want to make a few brief remarks. Firstly, for the record, can I declare I'm a member of Unite the Union and the GMB Union? And can I congratulate Lewis MacDonald for securing this debate and associate myself with the remarks he has made? Uh, I also, along with Richard Leonard, want to commend the Unite the Union and those in the gallery, uh, all those involved in the Back Home Safe campaign, as well as the ongoing work of the offshore coordinating group consisting of Unite and the other trade unions that organise offshore workers. As uh, we've heard, those who represent the workforce have been very clear. Despite the decision by the Civil Aviation Authority to lift the ban on the 225 and Mark II Super Pumas, there are still serious and fundamental questions to be asked about the safety record of these aircraft. Since 2009, 33 workers have tragically died and 65 passengers and crew have had to be rescued as a result of accidents involving the Super Puma in the North Sea. Oil companies, as we've heard, have ruled out reinstating grounded Super Pumas at least until the root cause of last year's fatal accident off the coast of Norway is known. Statoil say they have no plans to use this helicopter ever again, even if they are cleared to do so by the Norwegian authorities. And Unite have warned that if the Super Pumas are reintroduced, then they are perfectly prepared to take industrial action to protect their members. As Lewis MacDonald and Richard Leonard have said, the workforce needs certainty and they need to have confidence in safety arrangements in the North Sea. That is why, whatever the future of the Super Puma itself, engagement with the trade unions must be a priority for government and for regulators going forward. The UK government must also reconsider the case for a full public inquiry into helicopter safety in the offshore sector. The RMT believe that unique operating conditions are a contributing factor to the number of fatal and non-fatal Super Puma accidents in the North Sea. High crosswinds, low temperatures and adverse conditions. Super Pumas operate worldwide without the poor safety record observed over recent years in the North Sea. We need to get to the bottom of why the safety of the aircraft is such an issue in the UK and Norway. And on that issue, it would be helpful if the Scottish Government could clarify their own position for the need uh, on, on an independent inquiry. Uh, once again, I congratulate Lewis MacDonald on securing this debate, and I would urge the Government and the regulators to take the action needed to restore uh, the confidence and trust of workers and helicopter safety in the North Sea. Thank you. I call Graham Day to be followed by Tom Mason. Uh, President Officer, can I first of all congratulate Lewis MacDonald as others have on securing a debate on this important issue? I, I was happy to support his motion because I, I believe this is a matter which ought um, in view of the worries of the offshore workforce and the fact some leading oil companies won't utilise the aircraft at the centre of this. This is an issue that ought to be aired in this place. At the very root of this for me, I think as others, 
have alluded to is one simple thing. No one should be travelling to their work harbouring concerns over whether they'll get there or return. And that's what the Airbus uh, survey of North Sea workers tells us the situation currently is, with 62% of respondents indicating that, given the choice, they would be unlikely to fly in a Super Puma helicopter. Now, these fears may well be misplaced. As MSPs, we've each of us been sent a briefing and video from the manufacturers of these aircraft, uh, who've been in Parliament today seeking to make the case that the measures that they've implemented following the incidents at the heart of the situation have rendered the models in question safe. And back at the beginning of the month, Airbus Chief Executive uh, C. Uh, Gion Forey flew in a helicopter uh, into a helicopter exhibition in London in a Super Puma H225 to demonstrate that the aircraft is safe for passenger use. It was a move that some might consider reminiscent of John Selwyn Gummer, the then agricultural minister during the BSE crisis as he tried to feed his daughter a burger and ate a bit himself to show that beef was safe to consume. But to be fair to Mr Fowry, he has acknowledged that it takes time to restore trust after accidents. And the truth is, we are a very long way away from reaching that destination. Those expressing concerns uh, are men and women, as Lewis MacDonald said, who earn their living in an extremely harsh and hazardous environment. They are hardy individuals. So if they are spooked, and the figures suggest they are, then this is a significant matter. We are, of course, looking at this following what we now know to be two tragic accidents which have similarities. One in 2009 off the coast of Peterhead, which saw 16 people lose their lives, and one in 2016 in Norway, which saw 13 sadly pass away. We also uh, have an additional incident with a Super Puma off Shetland, which saw four people perish in 2013. The Unite petition opposing reintroduction of the helicopters references the fact that overall, uh, over eight years, Super Pumas have been involved in six incidents, leading to 65 people being rescued from the North Sea and 33 families losing loved ones. Sitting alongside this, we're told Shell won't use the 225, BP won't use the Super Pumas until the completion of the formal investigation and the root cause of the Norwegian incident is identified, and Statoil, as we've heard, has stated it won't use these models ever again. Balancing this, Airbus have made modifications to the two models and the maintenance uh, programme. There are now lower, uh, lower thresholds for rejecting deteriorating components and more frequent example, uh, inspections, for example. I'm no expert in this area. I suspect, on balance, uh, these aircraft may be safer to be flying in than was previously the case. Uh, but it's the regular users who need to be convinced of this, not members of parliament. And I do find it surprising that the European Air Safety Agency and the UK and Norwegian civil aviation authorities have lifted their bans when no final report on the crash in Norway has been delivered and no definitive cause identified. The Accident uh, Investigation Board Norway published an interim report into the 2016 accident earlier this year. But owing to the scope and complexity of the investigation, which I of course recognise, it was unable to estimate a completion date for its investigation. And it states on the AIBN website, only the final investigation will represent the complete report. Presiding officer, against that backdrop, and given the concerns of our North Sea workers, Julian Martin's right, we need to proceed extremely cautiously. Thank you. I have Tom Mason to be followed by Elaine Smith. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And thanks to Lewis MacDonald for bringing this to the public attention. I, of course, remain a City of Aberdeen councillor. I have a number of constituents in the ward which do go offshore, and not least of all my own son, who regularly travels by helicopter. Our foremost concern in this debate is the safety of workers that rely on helicopter transportation as part of their day-to-day -day lives. We should reflect on the tragic accidents involved, involving these helicopters, but also on the work to improve them and make them safe for continued use. The point I make is this. The best judges of helicopter safety are not politicians or trade union officials. The best judges are the experts who specialize in aeronautical engineering. The improvements made to the H225LP and the AS332 L2 have met the standards of the Civil Aviation Authority and the European Aviation Safety Agency. Airbus has conducted extensive investigations into both helicopters. They cooperated with the international efforts with the CAA concluding with the decision, and I quote, 
only being made after receiving extensive information from Norwegian accident investigators and being satisfied with the subsequent changes introduced by Airbus helicopters through detailed assessment and analysis. If we were to call for banning these helicopters in spite of such conclusions, what does it say from the faith we have in our regulators? At what point do we abandon our trust in their ability to work in a diligent and competent manner? Why don't we ban all helicopters if that is the case? I believe that we are able to have this debate, then it should be concerned the standards the manufacturer needs to meet, not placing extra restrictions on aircraft that the experts already deemed safe. With that said, it's not enough to meet these standards and carry on as if nothing had happened. The lessons of the past must be learned. Regulatory bodies and manufacturers must focus on early preventive action, whatever the most remote possibility of a problem, if a problem arises. I expect this of all manufacturers and operators to whom offshore workers place their trust on a daily basis. I remember flying offshore in the 1970s, in the early part of the oil industry, and I'm encouraged by the progress made since that time. Back then, my one hand would not have been presented as a, as a risk to fellow passengers. Now, I'm pleased that today's standards mean that wouldn't be permitted, I would not be allowed offshore. I've not had the training, not had the equipment, and don't know how to handle it. And with one hand, it's totally impossible. I do not want to jeopardize my fellow passengers. Moving forward, I believe operators should review their procedures in, to ensure training is regularly improved and the flights are not overcrowded, unnecessarily weighted, or flying in excessive adverse conditions. Finally, in respect of the survey that the Airbus conducted earlier this year, it is, un, un, it's not, it is unsurprising that the majority would be uncomfortable flying in these aircraft, given that 56% were unaware of new safety measures applied to the aircraft. This is an early survey. More information is necessary to get so people to understand what is take, take, taking place. I think the widespread public engagement would help reassure oil and gas workers. I hope Airbus will consider this in, to a great extent. To include presiding officer, I believe we should accept nothing less than the highest possible standards for these helicopters. At the same time, however, we should trust the expertise of the CAA and the EASA. Our offshore industry personnel have every right to, for safe working conditions. We must hold the manufacturers to this and ensure that in future we see improved continuous safety evaluation, evaluation across the aviation industry. I thank you. Elaine Smith to be followed by Patrick Harry. Thank you, President Officer. Can I declare an interest as a member of Unite the Union, but also a personal interest as my son's a en uh, mechanical engineering student and currently applying to um, companies in the oil and gas sector, so I might have a very personal interest in this issue shortly. Um, can I also welcome members of Unite the Union to the Chamber and thank my colleague Lewis MacDonald for bringing this important debate this evening. As the convener of the RMT Scottish Parliamentary Group, I feel it's important that I put across the views of their members on this matter, as well as those of my own union, Unite. It's clear that offshore workers, the trade unions, and indeed the public, as pointed out by Mark Macdonald in his intervention, um, it's clear that these super pumas have an unacceptable safety record when flying workers to and from platforms in the North Sea, although it may not be quite as clear to Conservative colleagues in the chamber this evening. Undoubtedly, um, as Neil Bibby pointed out earlier, the unique conditions of the North Sea contribute to that inferior safety record with low temperatures and exceptionally high crosswinds. Presiding officer, the facts speak for themselves. The Super Puma has been responsible for the deaths of 33 people in North Sea crashes since 2009 and 65 other workers and crew have had to be rescued during that same period. And as highlighted in the motion, and as we've heard from others, offshore workers' confidence in super pumas as a result of this is extremely low, to say the least. The RMT's General Secretary, Mick Cash, has said 
If this were a public transport service, such a terrible pattern of failure would have been tackled long ago. When workers consistently point to helicopter transport as the number one safety concern, government and regulators at all levels must take action or we face further deterioration in the perception of safety at work offshore. In view of this, the RMT are calling for a fully independent inquiry into offshore helicopter operations covering regulatory standards and commercial pressures in order to restore trust and confidence in helicopter transport operations in the North Sea. And like colleagues, I look forward um, to hearing how the Scottish Government can assist, if minded, to achieve this independent inquiry. Meanwhile, Pat Rafferty, the Scottish Head of Unite, has said that thousands of offshore workers will be ready to strike if the Super Puma returns. Now, that's a serious situation, but this aircraft clearly presents a danger to people who work hard for our economy. And indeed, many workers in the sector have taken to referring to it as a flying coffin. And I think that gives us a very clear impression of how they view this particular helicopter. The opinion of those who know the job better than anyone should be taken very seriously, particularly since operators are not unbiased parties in this debate. President officer, there needs to be meaningful workforce engagement as a priority. Undoubtedly, improving the safety of helicopter transport for offshore workers is a major issue and it's crucial to the future employment of Scottish workers in the oil and gas industry. And if this is not done, then it's going to lead to more jobs and skills flowing away from our domestic industry and the increased use of cheap labour. This is already happening in the decommissioning sector. For example, Canadian Natural Resources paid non-EEA workers $45 per day to decommission the Murchison platform. And as we speak, the BP Miller platform is being decommissioned using a workforce employed by, from the Philippines who are living on a barge connected to the platform. President officer, these super pumas have been grounded since May 2016, and it seems beyond belief that they could be reintroduced without a proper independent inquiry. And, whilst there are ongoing and also whilst there are ongoing investigations into the cause of the gearbox fatigue and the alarm system failures. And further, last month, the European Aviation Safety Agency issued an emergency directive saying that a main rotor component in the 225 is susceptible to crack development. Is it any wonder that workers don't want to travel in these helicopters? And surely they must have the right not to do so. I understand from the workers today that some companies, and I think it was mentioned earlier in the debate, such as Statoil and Shell, have already indicated they won't be using Super Pumas, and I hope that other companies will follow. The safety of offshore workers must be our number one priority, and as such, these Super Pumas must stay grounded. Thank you. The last contribution in the open debate is Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I begin by offering my respects to those who have been most affected personally by this issue, especially, of course, uh, those who have lost a friend, a colleague uh, or a loved one. And can I also pay tribute to the trade unions who have been active on the issue and congratulate Lewis MacDonald for bringing the debate to the Chamber. I have occasionally encountered a preconception that the Greens would place a low priority uh, on any issue connected to the oil and gas industry. Uh, now, notwithstanding the fact that, of course, helicopter travel will be relevant for the future, even with the transition to offshore renewable energy sources, uh, I think it should be put on the record that workforce safety in relation to the existing fossil fuel industries should be a non-negotiable issue, regardless of the different views that we have about the vested interests of the fossil fuel industry itself. So just as I can oppose nuclear energy, nuclear safety remains an extremely important priority within that debate, and the same thing applies uh, in this context as well. And so with the recent downturn in the oil and gas industry, one of our most important areas of concern was for the potential, as Elaine Smith alluded to, for reducing the terms and, con and conditions uh, for the workforce, uh, or indeed the safety conditions uh, that they work with. That's a shared concern right across the political spectrum. Lewis MacDonald uh, opened the, the debate with a comparison with other modes of transport. And I suspect that many of us who travel to work on a bus or on a train would entirely understand the point that he's making and acknowledge uh, the uh, significant differences, not just the environmental conditions, uh, but the, the level uh, of safety measures that are needed. But as well as those clear differences, I think most people traveling to work on a bus or a train 
would absolutely recognize the importance of the question of trust. Trust in the safety uh, that, uh, that the workforce who, who have to travel to offshore installations by helicopter have a right to expect. When rail crashes take place, we see a, an immediate response in the trust that people have in the rail operators. When there are stories about the, the safety concerns relating to road vehicles, we see that reaction as well. How could we not empathize with those who are traveling to work in a more harsh environment with a much greater expectation that safety measures are taken to look after them uh, in, in relation to this form of transport? Even if we don't have the personal experience that Lewis MacDonald has had of going uh, on those helicopter journeys to offshore facilities, I think it's something, that question of trust is something that we can all relate to. And even if, even if measures have been taken by the manufacturer to address the concerns as they perceive them, if that trust hasn't been rebuilt, that in itself uh, is an unacceptable aspect of somebody's working conditions. If they're having to go to work uh, using a, a form of transport that causes that level of lack of trust, of anxiety, of fears, uh, uh, even if... Uh, work has been done. And how can that trust be rebuilt if there isn't full transparency by the industry, by the manufacturer, about the issues that they sought to address and how they have addressed them? And that lack of complete transparency is the principal reason why I join with those uh, who've expressed support for the proposal for a full independent inquiry into these issues. Greens will continue uh, to support that call uh, alongside those uh, representing the workforce. In the meantime, in the meantime, the decision should absolutely lie with the workforce, not just with the industry, not just with the regulators. The workforce should be respected, and if they wish to express clearly the view that the Super Puma should not be brought back into service, their decision, their decision should absolutely be one that we all respect. Thank you. I call Hamza Youssef to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also start by offering up my condolences and continued sympathy uh, of the Scottish Government for those that have lost family members, friends, indeed those from local communities uh, that have lo lost community members uh, in the tragic accidents that have taken place uh, involving uh, Super Puma helicopters. Can I also congratulate or welcome uh, Lewis MacDonald for bringing this debate to the parliamentary chamber. I think the debate, the, the, the quality of the contributions across the chamber has been uh, very, very high uh, indeed and really very nuanced uh, as well. There's been some key central themes throughout almost every contribution which I'll try to pick up on, as well as, of course, answering one or two questions that members uh, have also uh, posed. I thought the way uh, Lewis MacDonald started his contribution really importantly set the context. And other members picked up upon this, uh, including just Patrick Harvey a moment ago, that uh, there are very uh, few uh, professions uh, whereby the travel to that profession, to that place of work, could be so hazardous. Um, there are not many industries where you travel to work uh, where you must wear a full survival kit, uh, <coughs> a life jacket, a rebreather, uh, just as part of your traveling attire. So I have, as I know the chamber does, uh, the utmost respect for every man and woman, of course, who works uh, in the industry. Uh, the tragic accident on the 29th of uh, April last year in Norway, where 13 people sadly died, clearly underlines the risk and challenges of working in the North Sea. Of course, the accident followed tragedies in our own waters near Sumbra uh, and Peterhead. The most recent accident in Norway has been subject to extensive investigation, and indeed uh, that investigation by the Norwegian regulator continues. While the exact cause is still to be determined, the UK CAA and the Norwegian CAA announced an intention in July uh, to lift the restrictions that were placed on the H225 and also the AS332L2 Super Puma helicopters following the accident in April 2016. It is not uncommon to put in place air worthiness measures before accident investigations report. I'm aware that the UK CAA have not taken this decision lightly. They have made this after receiving extensive information from their Norwegian uh, counterparts and Norwegian accident investigators and being satisfied with the subsequent changes introduced by Airbus helicopters. 
I would like to be clear that any decision to lift these restrictions is made by the regulator, in this case, the UK CEA and the Norwegian CEA, and the Scottish Government doesn't have input into those uh, decisions. The regulator, of course, must maintain their independence from external uh, input. However, uh, I would say that the UK CEA must continue to work with helicopter operators, offshore industry, international regulators, but importantly, as everybody here has mentioned, unions, the workforce, and pilot representatives, because that is the key and the crux that every single member uh, just about has touched upon here, that uh, regardless of what is lifted, what is not, what restrictions have been put in place, what measures have been taken, what mitigation has been done, if the workforce do not have confidence, as is clear from the many surveys that have been quoted, if the workforce do not have confidence, uh, then uh, I'm afraid uh, you would not, of course, uh, want to force anybody to travel uh, to work uh, on, on a mode of transport that they are uh, deeply uncomfortable with. In relation to the questions that have been posed by a couple of members on the uh, inquiry and the public inquiry, I was looking at um, some of my notes and uh, I'm aware, and as members will be, that in the accidents that I've already mentioned prior to the, the accident in 2016, uh, the CAA, in conjunction with the European uh, Aviation Safety Agency, the Norwegian Aviation Authority, uh, and an independent peer review group undertook the review of offshore helicopter flying. Uh, there was a number uh, of recommendations that were made uh, on the back of that, and the recommendations are being taken forward by uh, OSAG, uh, the Offshore Helicopter Safety Action Group. The Scottish Government uh, very much supported this review, and Transport Scotland has observer status on the governance uh, body. I should say that we're generally satisfied that there is progress being made uh, in the right direction. Uh, I would be more than happy to meet with both United Union and, indeed, as uh, Elaine Smith rightly says, uh, the RMT, and, indeed, uh, if any members wish to join us in that meeting, to hear whether or not uh, those unions, the workforce, feel that uh, perhaps those recommendations are not being taken forward at the pace they would like to. And if that is the case, then I would like to hear from them uh, the case for uh, why they think a public inquiry, um, an independent inquiry, I should say, uh, may well be the right route to go down. I have not settled on that. The Scottish Government, as I say, is part or has observer status in the governance of OSAG, and therefore we would very much look to, to that body to continue uh, the work that they're doing uh, to give confidence where they can to the workforce. Uh, the lifting of, of these restrictions in the Super Puma, uh, as I say, has raised concerns uh, with the industry. Uh, the unions clearly put across the concerns of the workforce uh, they represent. Uh, the recent uh, surveys by Airbus uh, and, and petitions by Unite uh, have shown that there's a clear lack of confidence uh, when it comes to the Super Puma uh, helicopters. Uh, Airbus have a lot of work to do to rebuild that confidence uh, and trust in this aircraft, and uh, not only with the workforce and unions, uh, but with operators as well. And I think a number of members uh, have mentioned some of those oil and gas operators who have been very clear in the view publicly that they have no plans for the return of Super Pumas to their North Sea operations. Uh, the passengers, flight crews, their families must have confidence that everything possible is done by regulators, the aircraft operators, the manufacturers, and the oil and gas industry to minimise the risk when flying in the North Sea. I believe Airbus has worked hard to learn from this accident. I think a number of members have said that they've uh, met with them, some uh, in the recent days uh, and some perhaps before that. Uh, and I would say that uh, Airbus uh, and their team uh, have not taken these accidents lightly uh, at all, have put uh, some of their uh, best minds to finding solutions that they hope uh, will give confidence. But now, nonetheless, it is now critical, absolutely critical, for Airbus to work with the, air f the, the workforce, with the unions, of course, uh, the industry uh, and the regulator to attempt to reinstill confidence uh, and trust in the aircraft's safety. The CA announcement does not mean an immediate return to the service of the Super Puma. A plan of checks, modifications and inspections would need to be undertaken before any flight could take place. Any reintroduction would need to be on the basis of a robust safety case being submitted by the operator to ensure that they have the necessary measures in place. Now that the regulators have made their decision to lift the restrictions, it is ultimately, of course, for the helicopter operators. But I would strongly encourage the operators and their customers to consider the views of the workforce. They are the people, the men and the women, that have to travel on a daily, a weekly uh, basis uh, on these uh, super pumas. The workforce must play a key part in any decision to reintroduce the Super Puma back into North Sea operations. No decision to reinstate the Super Puma should be made 
unilaterally with, uh, without uh, that workforce engagement uh, at its heart. The safety of workers in the North Sea has been and will always be the highest priority for this government. I'm reassured to see a desire among the industry, including the unions, helicopter operators, the manufacturer, oil and gas companies, and regulatory bodies to do everything possible to ensure workers in the North Sea have a safe journey to their place of work. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting.